Now everybody who is commenting on the crisis, and everybody who is not lazy is commenting on the crisis, uh, basically they're going to say that the crisis has at least four dimensions. You have the economic crisis as a debt crisis, competitiveness, there is no economic growth. Economists like to talk about this. There are going to be people talking very much about the institutional crisis of the Union, and this is best seen in the fact that you have a common, common currency without having the kind of a common treasury, also very much debated. There is a less talk about the political crisis. People are going to say that there is a political crisis, but then they're going to talk about the problem of the leadership. It's, it's different if you have a political crisis and if you have a leadership crisis, and especially what exactly the leadership crisis means, it's not always very clear. And there is a social crisis in many places. For example, if you see Greece, the basic problem is the very kind of survival of the Greek society. It's not simply on the problem of the political institutions, but this type of a crisis is discussed always in the national debates when people are talking about their own problems and never on the level of the European Union as a whole. So as a result of this, what I'll start doing is, in order to have this crisis together and think about them together, I'll start with a very simple point. And my point is that the European Union, as we knew it, even two years ago, does not exist anymore. And it does not exist first because all the major integrating forces that people have been talking about, all these famous pillars of the European Union that people have been discussing, they are not here anymore. The first one, which everybody starts talking about, is the memories of the World War II. And everybody is talking about the peace project. But let me give you one example. Three months ago, there was a study, four months ago, that had been done in the German schools asking people basically to give their views on how human rights have been uh, protected in four different regimes, starting with Nazi Germany, after that point with uh, Eastern Germany, Federal Republic, and Germany now. One third of the German uh, school boys and girls believe uh, that uh, the human rights have been as protected during the Nazi Germany as they, they are protected now. Uh, and based on many of these issues, you're going to see that uh, the Nazi period simply has disappeared. It's not that you have, this is not about nostalgia, this is not that people want to go back. For this younger generation, it simply doesn't matter much. And it doesn't matter, uh, and this is basically what we can see also in other countries. With the internet and the possibility for the younger people much more to communicate, within their own generation. Because one of the things that is happening is that the internet makes it much easier to you to talk to people on your age from all other places. There is less eagerness to talk with the people from the different generations. So, in a certain way, Fukuyama was right about the end of history, but in a wrong sense. The history ended because nobody is interested in it anymore. But what I basically want to make, the first point is that you do not have the memory of the World War II existing as a shaping factor in European politics these days. You can hear this in speeches. You're not going to see the way people are trying to understand, probably with the exception of the, of the older generations. Plus, you have all these new immigrants and others coming outside of Europe, whom all this talk about World War II does not make any sense. If you have an African immigrant going to France, all this story about the French-German relations, so this is the first, but don't forget how much we have been basically trying to link the problem of Europe with the problem of, uh, of the world, world War II. The second is the geopolitical rationale for the European Union. The Soviet Union is not around anymore, and Europeans feel so secure. Uh, we have been making the studies basically, especially even on the level of the European elites, uh, that even for the European elites these days, they cannot imagine a real security threat. When you're pushing them to talk about the security threat, they go about climate change and about economic developments and others. Not a classical hard security problem being perceived. And for sure, Russia cannot play the role the Soviet Union is being in order to unify uh, uh, European publics. The third important thing that people are always talking about the European Union is prosperity. But let's give you the results of uh, the survey that has been done in all European countries in April of this year. More than 60% of Europeans are sure that their kids are going to have a life which is worse than their own. 
And this goes in different countries. In Greek Germany, or well now in suffering increase, if there is something which is common, this is the understanding that the next generation is going to be a worse off. It's not going to be a better off. And also, if you go with the problem of the democratic welfare state, that was so important for the European project, here you also have a problem. I'm strongly uh, recommending to you the work by a German sociologist and political scientist, Walter Streck, uh, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, but he did, in my view, uh, a very interesting analysis on the political economy of the welfare state. And the major argument is that the welfare state, it's not simply that it cannot be sustained because of the costs, the normal liberal argument that you're taking. The problem is that even now, when you have this major crisis at the market, the trust in the government is not coming back. And by the way, from this point of view, this crisis is very different than all previous crises. In the 1930s, people started to mistrust the, the market as a result of the Great Depression, but they started trusting the government. And this was true for the United States, it was true for Soviet Russia, it was true for Nazi Germany. In the 1970s, you had the other way around. There was a major disappointment with the economic performance of the governments. People believed that the government cannot do it anymore. But there was a regained trust in the market. Now you have mistrust both to the government and to the market. And it goes on different levels. And Streck's major argument is that in a strange way, you cannot expect anymore that the failure of the market is going to push for the regain of the trust of the government. Because what has happened is that, in his language, the demands for the government of goods has disappeared. The government was great when he was facing the needs of people. The government was great when it was treating people as equal. But now, because of the way the market basically has socialized us, we don't want to be treated as equal. We want to be treated personally. We basically all the time want it to be taken personally in the way basically the market is treating you. And from this point of view, this is very important because if the welfare state is in crisis for the European Union, this is the other name of the European model. But there are four other, in my view, important factors behind my uh, claim that the European Union, as we know it, does not exist anymore. The first is the balance of power. The European Union was about German Franco leadership, and now the relations between France and Germany are very different. To talk about the and the typical partnership between Germany and France is not the case. And even more, the modern crisis is going to develop, the difference of power between Germany and France is going to increase. So the power structure from this point of view uh, of the European uh, dynamic has been very much changed. Plus, if the uh, European Union was very much created with the idea to handle the tensions between East and West of Europe, now you can see that the tensions between North and East, uh, South are becoming much more important. Uh, uh, than basically the classical uh, East-West within the European Union. The second is the convergence. For the last 30 years, the poor parts of the European Union have been becoming or coming closer in terms of wealth to the richer parts of the European Union. With this crisis, this is over. If we're going to have the projections which everybody is working with on the performance of Greece and Germany, you're going to see that in 20 years, Greece is going to be poorer with respect to Germany than it was when it entered the European Union. So even before the European Union was a convergence machine, basically taking and redistributing, you're going to see that now you're going much more to see the convergence of policies, but uh, uh, divergence uh, of performances. And plus, which in my view is also quite important, you have the problem with the crisis of solidarity. Uh, even theoretically, it's very difficult to keep the solidarity on the European level. Tell me how to do it. Why, for example, imagine that you are, and this is true for the Poles, for Germans, quite a bit, but why you should give money to the Greeks? On one level, if you are very much kind of an altruistic person, is it not better to give money to the kids in Africa who are really dying? out of hunger. So is this solidarity on a global level not much more natural? You're giving to those who need most. On the other side, if you're much more kind of a community person and basically thinking in terms of solidarity of family and locality, is it not much easier to give to somebody who is poor and who you know personally? I must 
asking this because there was a very mildly extremely interesting study being done asking the question what determines the support or the lack of support of the German voters with the respective degree bailout. And normally the politicians are going to tell you that what basically determines the support is the economic interest of the people. This study does not uh, basically show this. It appeared that the level of altruism and cosmopolitanism is a much more strong predictor if somebody is going to support the Greek bailout or not. Not basically the economic interest coming out of it. And by the way, much stronger than party affiliation. It was done in Austria in a very nice way because it was a combination of a classical survey technique with some of these tricks of the behaviorist economics which are becoming so popular these days, which means that when you've been basically surveyed, they're telling you also that you can just win a voucher of 100 euro. And you should decide to which type of a charity you're going to donate it. And you have the African Kids Charity, you have the local charity, <laughs> basically you have all this. So they're trying to see in a certain way what is the map uh, of your solidarity. And it appeared that people who are much more altruistically uh, positioning themselves, which are really going to give to others, are much more ready to support the Greek bell, even if their economic interest goes against it. And uh, the last and my most important uh, uh, argument why the European Union, as we know it, does not exist anymore, it's simply the fact that uh, seen from outside European Union has been changed very much. Recently we had basically this uh, 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 conference in which we invited Chinese, Russians, Turks and Americans to talk about the European crisis. It was amazing. To the Chinese, strangely enough, <laughs> the result of the crisis is that according to them now there are two Europes. There is one Europe which works, and it's called Germany. And this is another Europe which does not work, and they are not much interested in it anyway. But for Chinese, everything is about China. It's very much in what looking debate. Americans, much more than before, in a certain way, are interested uh, for Europe to make it. But on the other side, they cannot understand why Europe is doing nothing to become the United States of Europe. Because for them, basically, they perceive their own constitutional arrangement as the natural one, and they cannot understand why we're not moving in this direction. Uh, Russians being very ambiguous. On one level, they never believed in the post-national formations because they basically believed that the Soviet Union was such a formation that collapsed. On the other side, they are very much fearing that the crisis of the European Union is going very much also to touch on them. Strangely enough, for the first time this year, Public opinions, both in Russia and Turkey, claim that Asia is more important for their countries than the European Union. Uh, there was a study that we've been dying for the last decade of transatlantic trends. Uh, and of course, Turkey is the only one who has been very much interested for different reasons in the crisis. But why am I saying this? I'm saying this because not that the European Union was perceived as bad or collapsing. I don't believe that you have this in any of these war debates. But the European Union starts to be perceived more and more as irrelevant to their own problems because all things that before we believe the universal in our experience start to be viewed by others as exceptional. The postmodern nature of our politics, the way we're basically organizing all this. For the Chinese, for the Russians, for the Turks, and even for the Americans, it looks, it's fine, but it's not about us. And secondly, this crisis shows one very important kind of a understanding of the weakness of Europe as a global power. Uh, German sociologist Nicholas Luhmann uh, had a very, in my view, interesting and important uh, definition of power, where he basically believed that the power, this is the capacity to overthrow your problems on others. And from this point, if you look at two players that have a huge debt problem, on one side is the United States of America, huge debt problem. By the way, also quite dysfunctional political system recently. Nevertheless, the Americans basically are refinancing their debt on a very favorable terms. On the other side, at least until recently, you can see Spain and Italy and Greece being totally punished, punished for their debt exactly because the European Union did not succeed to make our problem other people's problem. The major message to Europe was you have a problem, solve it. The major problem with the Americans was they have a problem, we have a problem. Uh, and I do believe this is also something that basically pushes me 
uh, to make this statement that the European Union, as we know it, does not exist anymore. And there comes a the second point, and this is, should we take disintegration as a starting point of analysis? The strange story about disintegration is that people simply hate talking about it. This was very funny. I was uh, uh, talking uh, a year ago, because we started some seminars on this political logic of disintegration in Vienna. So I talked to Mr. Barroso, who said, what are you doing concerning the European crisis? So I said, listen, we're planning this. I said, I'm interested in this. And he gave a very political response to me. He said, this is an interesting question, but change the world. Call it fragmentation. And this tell me what is coming out of the conversation. But I don't want to be briefed on anything that has disintegration in the title. Why this is important? Because many people believe that disintegration is impossible because it is impossible. And it is impossible because economically it's very costly. There is not a living economist who is not going to tell you that the cost of disintegration is very high for everybody. They're, no go they're not going to be winners out of it. Secondly, because normatively, honestly speaking, what is the alternative? Even people who are very skeptic, even people who are basically attacking the European Union, most of them are doing this believing that disintegration is not going to happen. Because the return to the classical nation state looks very utopian. And secondly, to believe that, for example, a country like Bulgaria is going to do better in the world outside the European Union, you need quite a lot of imagination. Uh, and plus, this lack of political alternative, the fact that even those who are talking very toughly against Europe are much more faking it, talking because they know it's a low-cost rhetoric, makes everybody to believe that disintegration should not be taken seriously. And here comes, in a certain way, my disagreement with this debate. As I told you, I have been very much interested how projects disintegrate. So what we did in Vienna, we organized two small seminars. First, we invited people, historians mostly, who know very well how Soviet Union disintegrated. And after that, we did the same with people about the Habsburg Empire. Historians are very interesting people. The first is that the very idea that you believe that something is unthinkable can become a risk factor. For example, if I do believe that European Union cannot collapse under any type of scenario, and for example, if I'm the Prime Minister of Poland, this gives me justification to play a much more radical game. For example, to be to, this is not the Polish game, okay, if other countries. Uh, but basically, I can be to different policies, I can blackmail, I can push, because I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid that the project is fragile. And exactly this was the problem with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union. Well, for, from the point of view of the elites, was perceived as so unthinkable to collapse because of this and that. Also because nobody at this moment outside of the Soviet Union was pushing in this direction, that different political players had been playing a different game. So the most important thing about this integration is that normally this is unintended consequence. For the European Union to collapse, you do not need to have a strong anti-European forces. For the European Union to collapse, you simply can have a vicious circles of a wrong or ill-performed reforms that by default can come up with the outcome which is not supported by anybody. And I believe this is the type of the story which very uh, few people have been discussing, but this is something that we know very well from history. But then comes the question of what disintegration means. In the case of the Habsburg Empire, in the case of the Soviet Union, there were states. So when you disintegrate, you know that something is happening on the map. There is no such a country. By the way, from this point of view, it's very interesting to look at the Habsburg example. In 1867, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire came, you have a very radical transformation. You end up with two administrations, two armies, in a way. But because from the point of view of the monarch, disintegration means not to allow the crown to lose its power. This was not disintegration, this was adjustment. What it means for the European Union? What should happen? So all of us here to agree that the European Union has disintegrated. Is the collapse of the euro as a common currency going to be enough? Most of the people will agree. Mrs. Merkel is going to say this. There are very important reasons to believe that disintegration of the euro is going to produce a major political crisis. 
But go and talk to some of the theoreticians like Andy Muravchik and others who are going to say, where is the problem? The whole European Union, before coming to common currency, if we're going back to the previous situation in this disintegration. Secondly, how many countries should decide to leave the European Union or be expelled from the European Union to decide that it is disintegration? For example, you remember big talk about Greece getting out of the Eurozone. If the United Kingdom is going to get out of the European Union, how to treat this one? And certainly, much more important, if we're talking about a project, what should happen in the countries themselves? If, for example, European Union, you're going to end up with five or six very dysfunctional democracies, so let's put it like this, very much democracies under questions, are we going to view this as disintegration or not? So if on the normative level you're going to get basically a problem, how are we going to define this? I'm saying this, and I go to the last point, basically, before going to the question. And this is how democracy played all this. Because these days, you have three totally different, and in my view, to listen to people in books like totally unrelated ways. They talk about democracy in the way of the crisis. One is basically how the crisis, economic crisis, affected the performance of democracy as a whole. And let's give you some data. Uh, and the data is that basically, most one third of the people in Europe on the basis of the uh, 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 Europe Oriental study believe that their vote does not matter when it comes to the European Union. That the voters basically they feel totally uh, disappointed. And secondly, uh, there is now very much rising fear of populist parties, extreme parties. There is a lot of talk how the crisis can really remake our politics, uh, making many things that till yesterday can be looking totally impossible possible. The other one, which for me is very important and much less debated, is the fact that if the proposed constitutional changes that now are related with uh, the political union are going to take place, namely, uh, if, for example, budget deficits are going to be put into constitution, if most of this economic decision making is going to be constitutionalized, we're going to enter with a totally different type of a political regime uh, because the major economic decisions are going to be taken out of the electoral politics. Basically, you can change governments. You cannot change policies. And these new relations between the markets and the voters can be very much uh, seen in the way Mr. Berlusconi had been uh, uh, kicked out of his position of prime minister. We have all these people who went on the streets to celebrate the end of the Berlusconi regime, but it was not the people on the street who decided his fate. It was very much the market in the Brussels that decided his fate. So the people on the street basically have been like the Italians who met the Napoleon army in 1796. They have been much more spectators than basically the actors in this drama. So why am I making the, uh, uh, this comment going to my last point? One of the most interesting results of this survey that I'm talking about is that there is a very strong positive correlation between disappointment with the performance of the national democracies and the support for political union. Basically, countries in which voters don't believe in their national democracies anymore, Greece, Italy, are much more ready to support political union. Nevertheless, they are very critical to some of the policies coming from Brussels. On the other side, countries like Germany or Netherlands, where people are much more supportive for the policies that now European Union economic policy is uh, suggesting, are much more critical to the idea of the political union because they trust their political systems. Strangely enough, and this is my last point, support for the European Union as a common political union comes not so much from support for democracy, but from disappointment with democracy. And from this point of view, the situation is very different than the situation in a kind of a previous stories that we are talking about, either the Soviet collapse or the Habsburg collapse. Because in both cases, you have a non-democratic regime where basically people can imagine that after they can start voting, after having self-determinations and others, uh, they can have a better alternative to what's happening. Now, strangely enough, disappointment with democracy is becoming one of the major arguments for people to say, listen, yes, it's true, we don't know Brussels, and of course most of these bureaucrats are not performing well, but they cannot be worse than my own government. So I'll stop here.